but not surprising. I'm Jill Harms, the Executive Director of the George Schnitzer Museum of Art. And this event, this uh, very special conversation with Rick Barto, Charles Froelich, um, and Bob Kiefer, is sponsored by Lane Arts Council. So thank you, Lane Arts Council, for arranging this. of course, because this is just a prequel um, of our major exhibition, and you've probably seen the catalog on the side, um, Rick Barto, Things You Know But Cannot Explain. It's my new book. And, and, and going fast. Going really fast, so get your copy while you can before we have to reprint this. But we want to invite all of you to the public opening of this exhibition, which is on Friday, April 17th. At 5.30 p.m., we'll have a public ceremony outside the museum, and then everyone's invited to come in and enjoy the show. So um, it's you know, been a wonderful um, opportunity to get to know Rick, his work, and do this. And I want to um, ask Daniel now to stand up, who's co-curator of the exhibition with me. And his So in no particular order, in 2013, the Oregon Business Journal profiled Charles Frohler and called him one of the city's iconic gallery owners. Well, he's that and so much more. Charles dreamed of being an artist, and in his own way he is, in everything you do, it's the way you live your life, right? Um, <laughs> he attended the University of North Texas and received a BFA in sculpture in 1991. He also um, worked in the Hiram Butler Gallery in Houston, and I think that was a life-changing opportunity when he realized he really loved the kind of work there, connecting artists to um, people who would appreciate their work. Um, he worked with Hiram Butler full-time until moving to Portland, where in 1992 he began working at the legendary Jameson Thomas Gallery and met Rick Barto just right away. So after William Jameson's untimely death in 1995 from HIV complications, Charles opened his own gallery, and I hope all of you have been to his gallery, not surprisingly called the Charles Furlitt Gallery in Portland. And Rick was the first artist he presented. Now, he's even told me that Rick is his favorite artist. So I hope that none of the rest of you are represented. <laughs> Certainly today he is. He's going to turn red. OK, so Rick Barto is one of our nation's most prominent contemporary Native American artists. He was born in Newport, Oregon in 1946 and is a member of the Weop tribe of Northern California. He has close ties with the Select community, too. Rick graduated in 1969 from Western Oregon University with a degree in secondary arts education and served in the Vietnam War. He is a prolific and fearless artist who works with great fluency in both 2D and 3D media. I could spend the whole time talking to you about Rick, but I. No, he will do that. <laughs> and I want you to come and see his work at the museum. Um, he is represented, his work is represented in more than 60 collections, um, including the Yale University Art Gallery, Brooklyn Museum, and the Peabody Essex Museum, just to name a few. And his art has been referenced in more than 250 books, catalogs, and articles. Writer and photographer Bob Kiefer graduated from Harvard University in 1975. <laughs> okay, well, it's, and spent four decades as a newspaper writer before retiring in 2013 to pursue landscape photography and independent writing. He wrote about art and artists for most of the 30 years he was at the Register Guard and is now editor of Eugene Art Talk, a subscription arts blog which you can Google and join. So without further ado, please join me in thanking our three speakers, and I'm sure we're in for something very special.
Well, uh, yes, thank you all for coming. This is thrilling to see like, practically every seat in the house occupied and more people wandering <coughs> in. Um, I've known Rick Bartow for a long time as a writer and have long been an, an admirer of both him personally and of his incredible artwork. I want to take just a second to explain what you're seeing on the screens here. Um, when I talked with Charles Froelich about could we do some kind of slideshow um, component here, he suggested putting up images of four artist books that Rick did in 2009. These images are small, about the size of this notebook, and because the works are fragile and small and don't display well, Charles suggested that this would be a great way to show them just in automatic rotation while the three of us talk about Rick's work. With that, I'm just going to plunge in and be an annoying reporter and start firing questions at these two gentlemen. And uh, of course, Rick, I'm going to ask you the first question, which is, uh, in, in the time that I've known you, you have struck me as one of the artists who could sell his work for the most money and yet is the least precious about it. I've seen you just in conversation tear up work in front of me or start scratching on it with a crayon or a pencil. What, what makes you so loose about ownership of your work? Because I make a lot of work, I can show off. <laughs> I think it's probably true. Well, tearing up your work in front of a reporter yeah, is a form of performance art. I spent about two or three hours with a class at Mich Michigan at uh, Kalamazoo, Michigan. And uh, talking about you know, the, 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 the importance of word and art for the students to be aware that now it's the time for that secret language that young people only know. And old people have had our magic mission moment. Get out of the way. Make room for young people who are starting to find a new language of art, of thinking. So there are things that we can help them perhaps with craft and about here and there, but mostly I think for young people it's to leave them open, provide material, <coughs> see what the hell they're going to get with it. And for me, working with them, to show them that it is really time for us to move on, I tore the drawing after two or three hours into about 50 pieces and signed it to anyone who wanted a real bar <laughs> It really is because I can make a lot of work, but there's more to that, and that is that the moment that I'm working is the part that's the best. Uh, I really don't feel comfortable sitting here with you. I just assume be home uh, because right next to me is the co-op that has the coffee <laughs> and also chocolate. <laughs> um, so, to make art is a sacred sort of thing, but as the old Ab Aborigine elder, one, one guy that I heard talking, he said that when he's done, the prayer is over, the work is a byproduct, he can use it to start a fire, because the important is the creation. But, but, but let me pull Charles in here. Nah. Yeah, good, um, <laughs> <laughs> It'll only muddy the water. <laughs> it'll, it'll, it'll be interesting much. I, 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 this is actually literally the first time I've interviewed an artist and a gallerist together. And so I want to know from Charles, what is the role of a gallerist in guiding or nurturing a visionary artist? I think there are a variety of ranges of work that a gallery can do for an artist. And if it is, well, what I do is represent artists, hopefully long term. And I want to have their work have a catapult into more visibility out 
outside of their home, outside of their studio, outside of their hometown, outside of their home state. And that's one of that's the work that I do for the artist. But then to encourage a visionary, I think we have to be comfortable. Uh, it takes time. Um, saying yes to work with an artist a long time, long term means it's like a marriage. It's, it's a very special, close relationship. And people come to me to ask all the questions about the artists that I represent. And I'm, it, I hate having to say, I don't really know how to answer that one. So I'm, I go to those studios and I'm on the phone and I'm uh, asking the artists, my artists that I represent, not intimate questions that are digging, but just I want to know all of those motivations. And it's a partnership that also is built on trust, where I have to trust them that, uh, that they're, well, trust is built through so many uh, events and experiences in the relationship. And they have to trust me, and I'll say, it's, uh, being in a position of a dealer is, I always think, oh, you know, artists, who knows if they're going to trust me or not. But, so you have to put you know, your best work to um, be successful in getting the artist's work out there. Um, and I have to get to know the artist's work, and when I can see that their vision is really clear, then it's like, let it rip, just go, and I'm not, I don't want to say a thing. And artists will ask me though, when is it time to have a critical discussion? And I, fortunately, I feel very comfortable with the artists that I work with. Where to have those conversations where I don't, maybe I don't get or understand a series, or maybe I don't know why they're working a certain way or what the content change or shift has been. And there are, there are moments when I've had arguments with Rick, and it's been about... Who won? <laughs> <laughs> and in, in many ways that you channel a kind of spirit in your work. I think my, my favorite quote from you is that the spirit flows in one ear and out the other and you try to grab hold. So how, how does a person arrange their life so they have even the slightest chance of grabbing that spirit? It's a tickly area, but it always comes back to work, and, and work is the, the be and all, to be able to work. Um, the spirit, without getting woo-woo or goofy about it, or only Native Americans can do this. <laughs> um, the spirit is, is a thing, and it has maybe different names, like, uh, what is another word for spirit? What do we call that? The, 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 the muse. The muse probably be the same thing. It's, it's a, a place where we are open so, so uh, that things can come to us that we can't 
speak about it. We can speak about it, but we can't we can't see it or smell it or taste it. But we know that it's there. And that's the title for the book which I'm shameless pushing here. <laughs> Only, and Christmas is just around the corner. <laughs> But the spirit, it, we, you know, for me, I'm part of the Red Road belief of Native American spiritual way of looking at the world. I don't, I don't have to join anybody or pay dues. It just is. And in that place, if I'm open to it, then it comes to me. But as we were talking earlier, just a couple of days ago, we were talking about Vincent Van Gogh, who said that you know he gave himself to the art, and because it it, it proved his undoing, because it took over him. But I found, truth be tell you, there there were there were a couple of times, you know, when I was sitting at home with the cat and with the how the wanted our, what do you call them, callous, carocytes, callocytes, callocytes, carocytes, wanted looking for a job. Classified. Hmm? Classified. Classified. I also possession of brain damage with stroke, and I can figure out new words that every day. <laughs> <laughs> Asked one lady for a quickie one time. <laughs> it got even worse when I turned right around and asked her again. <laughs> so I go slow and sound a little slow because I have to be careful not to tell that story twice. <laughs> um, so the spirit is an energy and it is a real thing. And the more that I welcome it and make myself available, the more color blows off into the paper. Now. And I don't worry about it. About the only place where I'm comfortable in the world is when I'm with my son, or when I'm working, or with someone such as Charles that I've known for years now. Um, I'm a one-trip pony, and that's what I do, and that's all I want to do. Now, you have traveled the world. You, you have traveled probably more than 99% of the people in this room, probably starting with, with your government-sponsored trip to Vietnam. Yeah. But you've been to Japan, Germany, you've been to New Zealand. You've been to Mexico. I'm sure I've missed a lot of places too. What what has that done for you, Calabas? And Calabas, <laughs> very cold. And the crows were out at 11 o'clock at night. And it was below zero. What it does is I was absolutely ecstatic when I came back from a few of those trips to find that it's true what people had said, that as people we are more alike than different. And both, that was a wonderful thing to find that I was figuring out how to communicate with a Japanese farmer on the west coast of Japan, Ponch, and up in the top of the uh, Japanese Alps. It's now a, a ghost town where I was there three years back, one of them in a ghost town, because the uh, last big earthquake had rendered the place nothing. So I find that is, the, I think, the best, neatest thing is to really find somebody saying that and then find that it is really true that we didn't have one word together, but we could understand quite clearly what was going on. 
and that we go in these places as ambassadors, whether we want to or not, with the art. It was, it was so wonderful to pull into a, an old farm customs, uh, uh, a farm couple who opened the door and then in their in their entryway was was a, one of my posters of a piece done in Coos Bay. And they, they were very happy to show that to me outside there. I, as my uncle used to say, maybe it would keep the rats out, but it was there. <laughs> <laughs> Tom, oh, go on. No, no, I'd rather hear what he had to say. <laughs> Charles, you, you um, and I don't actually know the answer to this question, but did you work for William Jameson when he picked up Rick as a client or as a, a, an artist? I picked him up. You picked him up. I was wondering if you could articulate what it was that um, the gallery saw in this young, crazy looking artist. On fire with what exactly? Making the art, just fearlessly diving in and making the art. And Rick had not had a, a gallery really affirming him, representing him, and his family was saying, well, you know, there's a guy down the road that sells his saws. You can sell your pants for a hundred dollars too. <laughs> <laughs> so, and I bet you could. <laughs> He, he chose if I could interrupt him. I I take the old fence, fence posts out of the pasture in South South Beach and make them into dogs with all the nails and the wire wrapped around them. Oh man, he he could barely handle that. My old uncle. <laughs> But then he heard that we sold one for fifteen hundred dollars, and he brought me a wheelbarrow. For it. <laughs> 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 it also, um, a, a lot of your work is is very expressive uh, to the point that it almost seems out of control. And obviously, some of your early sculpture frightened the, your gallery. So, but you also do these very finely controlled prints. What took you in that direction? You've got to try it to see if it works. And you've got to be doing something because, as I've been pointing out to people, it is, in fact, a job. It's a wonderful job, and it's a very nettlesome one. And as many times I've talked with my son, saying that our, our bless, our, our, our art is blessed, and it's also a curse. Because not only is it hard to make a living, but it also will make you crazy, because you can found with Booker with sound and lyric, you could feel it, but you still can't quite get to it. And you're working with other people in a collaborative situation, and you're trying to get them out of that, to get them to do something. It's like a symphony in a way. And it's the same with the art. It's like a little symphony. It's like a little army marching across the paper, making marks. And you can see it almost. <coughs> And you make one mark, and then you're up the rest of the night trying to rectify what happened. <laughs> that you had it just a second, but you can't get that feeling back. You're back to the spirit again, and you're back to working, working, 
working, working, working. Nobody cares because nobody's seeing it that you're doing it, working, working, working. So between you and the spirit and you and work, there's nothing. Jan Zock, the sculptor who taught here at the university a generation ago, used to tell his students that the best art came from reaching for that thing you can't quite glimpse around the corner. Yeah, I think it's true. I think it's true. So how do you glimpse it more clearly? Working. <laughs> and it's in sincerity. The nights you'll be tired, and I've worked in, not so much because I'm older, I don't work so hard, but before I'd work in my fingers would bleed because of smudging things that would wear away my fingers and they would bleed. Working. And to get done, and I would just sit back there and think, oh boy, maybe a little dab of blue there, a surreal there, or something there. And <laughs> <laughs> Not time to go to bed. <laughs> No coffee, you've got to figure out how to get rid of that damn blue you <laughs> And the whole thing will change. You know, and then it'll be two or three in the morning and you go home, you know, I say, whoa, oh, boy, that didn't work so well. But it's no different. Uh, it's working. You know, you're working. You're working. And if you don't work, then nothing, you have nothing. I don't know why these people come. <laughs> but if I didn't put a picture up, or if you didn't talk to us, or Charles wasn't here, why, well, how would we communicate? Why would we do that? I, I don't know. It makes me very uncomfortable. I'd rather be home. <laughs> Alone. <laughs> You talked about that answer, yeah. and you, you have described that to me a bit. I wonder if you could tell these people what it was like to wake up, and what, what did you think, and what did you do? I didn't even get to wake up. I, I've been up. It's the doggone this thing. The, the brain, I say, you know, no matter what you end up with, the brain is an awesome, incredible organ. It is so completely let like a coyote or a raven or a crow or a blue jay. They can pull more tricks out of their hats than you can believe were inside of you. And all you can do is deal with it. And as I said before about the scope, if I would, wanted to feel sorry, I could suck my thumb, but the, the therapist I saw showed me what could really happen. And so I was very lucky, and I was made humble. And I continue to be humbled as I stumble through trying to find words. It's better now, much better, because in the morning I couldn't speak, I couldn't talk. There was paraphasia. So what we called at that time became yamma yamma talk. So anybody could have yabba yabba because you'd be talking and then I'd run out of words, and all of a sudden it'd just start going yabba 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 yabba. So when I first tried to sing with my band mace egging on, it sounded like the Muppets. <laughs> because my lips were like in a circle, so everything went <laughs> And I just started laughing and said, I can't go on like that. If you don't know, Rick is quite a rock and roll guitarist and plays regularly with the band. Uh, well, that's different people. now, so we'll, we'll show you on so Friday when we're here at uh, the reception, the, the band will play, but we won't be uh, the Swedish guy in Muppets. <laughs> <laughs> they kept pushing until, you know, in about an hour or two, we got more vowels coming out. And I was uh, lucky to find uh, uh, a uh, therapist there in town. I don't know if it means any reason that I was the last one she worked with and then left. <laughs> but uh, I'm very fortunate, I'm very humbled, and I'm pretty verbose, though I shouldn't be probably, because I have to think about what I'm talking about. 
but it hit the lyrics of songs that it left me alone to where I found stole a pen from the nurse when she wasn't looking and started drawing on a napkin and it made sense so I could call uh, my collector and, uh, Charles and say I'm going to be okay because I can still draw. Has it off. affected your art at all? Oh, I'd be silly to say that it did. Either as humility has brought me down or by the colors and the blast because I finally, I finally figured out that quote about uh, you know the uh, we're talking about something. Yeah. <coughs> yeah, to really make things clear, nothing like a sentence of death to my, you know, clear your eye, clarity gives you clarity. So sitting here now, I could fall over, and that would be it. It would be a mess. I'd be embarrassed, but uh, it's true. So now I find that the circle has an end in the Quarto. And uh, I can sit at home, suck on my thumb, or I can go ahead and do the work. And you know, some of the work is very early. They're very, very late here. They've been done real, real closely later here. I've had a very busy, productive, year and a half since the stroke um, because you know I saw the end of the circle it's not bad it didn't hurt very curious Charles what what did you do when you found out about Bert's stroke laughed <laughs> <laughs> after that you see I knew he had it <laughs> well who wants to hear this about something? It was a freak out, for uh -huh. sure. And there was Karen, uh, his close guardian angel in Newport, assured us that I talked to her and she said he's never lost consciousness. He can draw, he wrote his name, <laughs> his birthday. There were, there were things, there were all the signs that, that hadn't been catastrophic. But it, Major blow have the songs gone. And I said to me very clearly, they can take my words, but I hope they don't take my hand. And Rick, you know, I, I can see Rick the day he got out of the hospital, three days after the stroke happened. Um, we took him to the studio, and I was like, hey, Rick was looking around and like, some signatures on work that he had finished and he's like it's, it's gonna happen and the next day he walked to the studio and he entered one of the most productive phases that i've ever seen and it was experimental with scale and media and color and subject and so the that narrowing mary lopez says the horizon line getting closer Rick has said the clock is ticking, where, you know, it's like, well, better make it now. And the artwork has been fearless. And Rick is, I mean, you've been very productive. There are all sorts of artists. Jim Lavador says, like, it always makes me feel like a slug. <laughs> I mean, this is, he said that for years. Well, he, he works incredibly productive. Yeah. Yeah. And yeah. so this, Every every two weeks, Bill Avery, the friend and collector, will, will come in and he'll pull his car up and point at the back and it's full of paintings. <laughs> and I'll come over to see Rick and it's like, I feel my man with paintings. He's just constantly, he's been working. But Rick, what do you do when you hit dry spells? I don't. You don't? Why? Yes, you do. Work. <laughs> or <laughs> or <laughs> or 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 
my brain is always working. Sometimes I get too many things in. And I end up sitting in the chair staring with because I got too many things going on. And just to litigate one out, you know, it seems to be difficult. So after enough sitting around or thumbs, thumb sucking, then what I always used to fall into the younger people was to go to the studio and clean it up. Even if you're not working art and you're cleaning up the studio, organizing things, then you're available for the spirit to visit you once again. So uh, I don't tend to, longer now, I don't, don't worry about it because there's always something to go. But here, when we started the the prints, print uh, program here last week. I was just kind of hanging out. I didn't have any paint canvas. I painted all that up. I was thinking about some drawing that I didn't really think it was going to work right. So I've been going around and around looking at these pieces of paper and thinking about something else I was going to do. And then along comes the dry prints for Seiichi Hiroshima, the, my Japanese printer in Tokyo, and the Mika, Mika, Mika here. I met her on a Sunday. She drove over to the coast and brought me some uh, copper plates ready for etching. And so I was saved, so I had stuff to do there again. But now I'm back to nothing again. So when I get home, I'll have to figure something. I've got a couple ideas. And then and recently I found that I had macular degeneration. Uh, so I was going blind two weeks ago, which almost make you sit right up like a stroke almost. And all I could say was shift. And, sit and see what was going to happen. So I've had my first shot in the eye and it didn't hurt so I'm looking for another one before the reception does here um, to arrest it. So it's a little skewed but I can read, uh, can work. I can't do small things. Even that one, we didn't pull some off on those little bird beaks. They, they stayed in the lines. And so it's always a challenge. I can sit and just sit home and say, oh, I'm going to buy and I'm going to Let me jump, jump in here with a question off of that. Obviously, you, 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 you're an older gentleman, like, like myself, um, and you, you had some, some serious health issues. Does that clarify your plans for your artistic career for, for what's next? Keep working. It all works for denial after a while. You know. <laughs> Don't think about it as much. Keep working. But you find something in there to do. But I've yet found it to just stop me. I have no, uh, I have no blind sculptors, painters. So I'm thinking that while I'm sitting at the office in this place, I was thinking, uh, Or something else different. There's always something. There's something. The thing that can blow you out is if, if that stripe and uh, that stroke, stroke, TKOs, TKOs, you know, uh, that's something else. But so far it hasn't hurt, and it's been weird. I kind of like weird. <laughs> <laughs> and I live in a, you know, in a community that'll laugh with me. So, uh, you know, when I'm talking about something and completely shift gear someplace, they just laugh. I say, well, he's having a little paraphasia now. <coughs> so laughter is one way out of it. You know, to keep you back to the art. 
and there's no need to stop as long as you can do that. And if you can find laughter, uh, or to get something out of it that's, that's worth the, the trip. <laughs> Let's uh, um, have some questions from the audience. Oh, this is really good. This is the best part. You're going to love this. <laughs> yes. oh, they're all out no. there. Everyone's too shy. Okay. The, the question is, uh, for Charles, has, has Rick ever brought in work that you didn't use? All the time. <laughs> <laughs> wow. So, I, I referenced an argument. There was, we had one big argument. And, but, uh, uh, it, it is a marriage after all. Yeah. I mean, you, Well, you certainly did that day. <laughs> So the bottom dropped out around here, as it may have also in other places. Um, a lot of galleries went, yeah, went off the cliff here in town. We're, we're down to a smaller number. Um, what, what do you see as the future for commercial art galleries of quality?
prayer uh, to live in St. Martin, and it is, there is marketing, PR savvy, there are machines out there that are just, I mean, they're backed, they're corporate gallery machines, and, and I think, I got I could get really afraid of like, oh, what am I, I'm just this little independent gallery, you know, in, you know, in Portland, Oregon. And, but people want authentic art. And throughout the recession, I'll say, I thought, oh God, here comes the phase of only having flowers and duck beans. Because right? <laughs> <laughs> I thought that like, people would be so freaked out by their lives and their finances that they would want happy, pleasant things. Well, it was like the skulls won. <laughs> Left bloodletting and people like little old Lutheran altar ladies were coming in and buying death paintings. <laughs> and it was like, hey, okay, they went, people went for it. And I've always had a tough edge, I think, to the gallery. There have been a lot of narrative artists and volunteers in the gallery that, that are tough. And um, it was hard, for sure. but. And we sold a lot less work. We sold less expensive work, but it was still gutsy. Any more questions? Now? I have a question. Oh, gentleman in the back here. When you're working your images, your iconic images of birds and coyotes or wolves and people, are these imaginary images you're working from, or photographs, or sketches, or models? But let me just repeat that question is when, when Rick is working his iconic images that often involve wildlife and iconic figures like crows and ravens and wolves, does he work from imagination or from reference material or from life or how does he do it? Actually it's a little amalgam of everything. I have a, uh, what do you call that, a morgue. I have an old morgue which is a old tin box that's full of everything that might have caught my eye, tear it out of a book and put it in there. But, and also, in truth, where the drawing studio is, are completely uh, filled with bird species. Uh, great horned owl, eagle, bald eagle, Hawks, small birds, ducks, waterfowl. We live on a, on a nest or an area, and also a whole bunch of uh, beaver dams up behind the place. So there's also bear, coyote, elk, deer. So a lot of these animals. You know, you can see them when you're living there. And so it's not a big stretch to say that they become that way. I'd rather do that than uh, Mirandi doing blue bottles or something. I, I, I find delight in birds, animals. Uh, um, I like girls, you know, so I don't do nudes because I spend too much time on a piece or two, you know, so, <laughs> so I don't much do that. I, I do a lot of birds and animal forms and mixing them up. I used to think that was really uh, Native American, but if you look at Bosch and Bruegel, you see animals with heads on people. And then if you go even further back into the caves, you find the great bird man uh, drawing with a, a bird head on its head. So it's the circle still spinning. When I visited you at your studio some years ago, you had just acquired a bunch of moth eaten taxidermy specimens from somewhere, and I'm still having nightmares about that box. <laughs> yeah. Well, I made one into a museum, museum piece. Not much else out of them. They were laced with AC arsenic. <laughs> but uh, 
You had a question. Yeah. I saw your smiling face. See, I like good, 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 good choice. So, so uh, I'm a good picture, and so I'm really curious about, I like to take a picture of the Bible, and then I'm Maker tallied oil wants Rick to talk about his involvement in, in banking. Well, there is a magic in the sameness. I couldn't draw a same, you know, a straight line if I wanted to. And the drawing process is I can I can technically cannot or wouldn't want to bother to draw two drawings that are the same. But there's something magic about ink and lines and great pressure and you come up with an, an image. And an image, uh, there's something really interesting that, uh, looking at ancient uh, Kalowitz, her, her prints. When you're looking at something or a Rembrandt that's hundreds of years old, and there it is, you know, it's been restruck, but it's still Rembrandt is there making that mark. I have some small prints, and not of Rembrandt, but of older pieces, that I think of them as college classes to look at those small pieces. I have one that I particularly like from 1700s, I think, maybe the 1800s, but uh, a very sweet lady who is a countess. And in the time of the, what do they call them, the Grand? like the dr dr uh, 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 traveling. The Grand Tour. The Grand Tour. And it was the snap, snap Polaroid of these little drawings and general little water things that was by her husband or a friend who was on the, on the same trip. And so I had this little thing, beautiful little drawing, little washes and things in there. And I think of it as a as a complete a complete amid uh, an amid. I'm getting tired. It's a complete college class of lying and you know everything that you need to learn about is in that little picture of a little quick shot. I think we might have time for one more question here. Someone back there on the baseball cap. Okay. Well, <laughs> anyway, um, you had a show at Zeke in Milwaukee. And I'm wondering if that experience in a gallery touched on the Mexico quite a bit. If you felt a special spirit kind of feeling doing something like that in Oaxaca. Can you compare it to a more urbane type of gallery? Well, the question is from painter Richard Quigley, who noted that um, Rick has shown his work in Oaxaca, Mexico. He wanted to know if there was a, a spiritual dimension to showing there that was more obvious or prevalent than showing in an urban setting in the U.S. Really sort of the opposite, because I have a cousin who's married into Zapotec family. And they were very reluctant to go to the exhibition of the Yankee, huh? having set mind of that. And they were quite amazed when they saw the exhibition. They were very happy to come back and have more food with us. You are a real person. So, 
So, so there was a spiritual dimension, but it didn't weigh initially in your favor. Yeah. And the paper, I think the Washi in Japan, the paper, again, the paper has a spirit of its own. And the marks have their own. Have you ever tried to make a simple calligraphy mark with a brush and the ink? And it looks so flat, you know? And when somebody's really working, it's just alive, it vibrates, you know? And in talking, when you're speaking from that place to another person like that, then I think it's back to that again where we are more alike than we are different. So that when people to people come together, we don't have so much trouble. You know, when we touch from this place to that place, what the doctor man calls that sacred place. I think that's a perfect point to wrap this up for the evening. I want to thank you all for coming.